All right, here we are uh, at the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. Glenn Lowry here, Brown University, professor of economics. And uh, my guest, uh, who happens to be also performing the duties of technical uh, rec- rec- uh, technician of record on this particular encounter, is Professor Harold Pollock, Helen Ross, professor at the School of Social Services Administration at the University of Chicago. Harold, I learned an amazing fact about the uh, social science building in which I don't imagine that you're housed at the University of Chicago, which is that there's a stairwell in which there are swastikas that are embedded in the decor, at least there used to be some years ago when the speaker whom I heard last night talking about national monuments, uh, about the Confederate monuments and taking them down, uh, uh, Michelle uh, Moody Adams, who's a philosopher at Columbia University. In any case, uh, she's very interesting. But in any case, it wasn't her. It was one of the commenters at her talk who reported, uh, we were talking about the, the symbol, the swastika. Okay, so we ident- identified with the Nazis, but apparently it has a cultural uh, significance that uh, predates uh, uh, Adolf Hitler. And somehow in the construction of the social sciences building in the University of Chicago, which I imagine happened early in the 20th century, uh, the, this uh, symbol was used as, a, as an adornment of some kind in the stairwell. Did you know that? I did not know that. It is certainly true that one sees the swastika in its alternative cultural meanings on occasion. For example, the Baha'i Shrine in uh, north of Chicago has swastikas in, embedded in the outer walls, and, and you know, it's an Indian, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a religion, Eastern religious symbol and cultural symbol that just has nothing to do with. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. That's a that's a famous and very beautiful. Structure is it not that sits on the North uh, Lakeshore uh, up there, yeah. just north of Evanston, something? I it's used to when Manasha, I was a student I'd go up there sometimes. Yeah, the Baha'i are the most wonderful people, and unfortunately, Baha'i. I remember Mike Royko once said they are considered because they are pacifist. They are considered to be the suckers of uh, uh, you know in many interactions in the Middle East where they're horribly persecuted. Uh, uh, but you know, in Haifa, there's a wonderful Baha'i. Uh, uh, Baha'i Shrine in Haifa, Israel, and Haifa is probably you know is my is my favorite Israeli city. And one reason is that the Baha'is you, tolerance and inclusion and and mellow outlook on life is badly needed in that neighborhood. And it makes and it, and it creates a uh, uh, it, it's a place in Israel of great uh, of great inclusion and liberality that I admire. Well, you mentioned Haifa. I've been there. It's been many years. But all I can think of is Ilan Pape's uh, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Do you know the book? I don't know the book. Uh, you'll have to tell me. Okay, so this is a historian, somewhat maybe radical within the Israeli context historian, who has a book out there called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, which is a history that uh, interprets the events uh, around 1948 and immediately thereafter through a certain lens. And we obviously won't get into that. No doubt it's controversial. But my point is, in there, as I was reading that book, he tells a story what happens in Haifa after war breaks out uh, in uh, 1948 and uh, how Arab a city it had been. Yes, yes. And how the Jews lived higher up on the sloping hillsides of this uh, port city uh, than did the Arabs because they came later. Yeah. But that was very felicitous to the project of getting the Arabs out because uh, the militant Jews could roll barrels full of fuel oil that had been set aflame down the hill and burn these guys out. And that was one of the, I, I'm not an expert historian on this by any means, please audience don't get mad at me if I don't report this in exact detail, but I'm struck by that memory and the juxtaposition of it to your recollection of Haifa. As a, as a city of tolerance and uh, multicultural, vital uh, dynamism and so forth and so on, which is no doubt true, but, you know. Um, it came at some cost. Uh, well, you know, something had to happen, I suppose, in uh, the uh, uh, making of the, of the of, uh, you know, the Jewish homeland. Anyway, that was not what we came here to discuss. No, it's not, although it, it it's... It's a level of uh, profound remembrance that deserves respect, even if it's not uh, what we yeah. came to discuss. Uh, and I, I think that in these polarized and superficial times, it's actually valuable to have a 
to bring in s- some of the the largeness of of the topic that you just mentioned in, in this tragic dimension is probably useful to move us away from the Twitter mentality of uh, what President Trump said today. Uh, so that as, as a segue to our conversation, it's not. Harold and I, everybody should know our old friends. We've known each other for 30 plus years, uh, going all the way back to the 1980s. And uh, we've been kicking politics uh, around for a long time. I can remember some of those conversations we used to have in my office when you were a student, Harold Pollock, Helen Ross, professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I was a young, uh, younger, much younger <laughs> faculty member. <laughs> yes, I've learned quite a bit from you, Harold. <clears throat> and one of the things I've enjoyed about our conversations is that there's always been a serious philosophical dimension, although, you know, you're a policy geek uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a social science nerd, uh, but there's always been a serious uh, philosophical, ethical dimension to it. Um, so we live in these, uh, these perilous, interesting, uh, troubling, uh, quickening times. I mean, we live, we are kind of fortunate, aren't we, Harold, to, and, and just, you know, unfortunate for the rest of the world, but fortunate to be alive at a time when there's so much dynamism going on all around the world, including in our own uh, American politics and the ascendancy of Donald Trump and all of that that it's, uh, that that's brought out. Uh, I thought we wanted to talk about one aspect of that, uh, which is the threat that the rise of Trump, at least from your perspective, might pose to the health of American democracy broadly, How Democracies Die, a book that's out there which you've written, I haven't. Why don't you, uh, you know, take over and uh, sort of set the stage for us to talk about that a bit? Well, it's been quite a year uh, and the, and the pres, president Trump's not just President Trump's behavior in office, but the fact of his election uh, has been a chastening moment for many people who study democracies, and the and, and the fact that this represents a profound failure of our gatekeeping institutions at a number of levels, and it also creates some profound dilemmas in how to respond to the unworthiness of President Trump that does not make those failures worse. And this book, How Democracies Die, is a, is a beautiful but disturbing book that makes several points that identify how our democratic institutions are weaker than we tend to assume. And, uh, you know, in a number of ways, I regard, I, I think we, the President Trump's ascendance has permanently harmed the country. Uh, and I don't – and I think it really merits reflection you know, in a number of ways, one of them being that the disturbing aspect of President Trump is not so much his own behavior but the way that conventional politicians have found it useful and effective for them to make common purpose with him. And one of the things that – how democracies died uh, – tells very well is that if you look at the ascendance of autocrats in, in democracies, that that is the key point. There are many points, there are many autocrats who come to the fore in democracies, and in some cases, uh, the center-left and the center-right p- conventional politicians are able to come together and unite and say, okay, we're going to contain and hold accountable this figure. But in other cases, uh, conventional politicians decide, I can work with this guy, I can control him. And very often they, they, they achieve some practical ends that they like, like, for example, ideologically congenial judges. And then they discover, actually, I can't control this guy. And that – and it, Senator McConnell's behavior and Speaker Ryan's behavior and the way that the Nunes memo and things like that show the polarization of the checks and balances system, really very concerning in, in that light. So that's one thing that maybe we could, we could start with. Okay, let's start with that. Uh, I don't want to leave out the uh, Trump wants to have a military parade issue, so we can come back to that. I'm just I'm just marking that so we don't forget it. Uh, I want to I want to question uh, also partly for the sake of argument, but partly partly in a sincere way the uh, Trump unfitness uh, statement, and I and I want to also question the the threat to democracy and uh, failure of institutions, gatekeepers and so forth statement. And I actually want to do them with uh, a, a central, a single argument. I don't know if this adds up to an argument or a series of observations. 
So here's my concern. My concern is really your reaction is the threat to democracy. That puts it very, very starkly. Democracy in the direct sense that there was an election in 2016 which had a particular outcome. Okay. That's my demo- that's my democratic touchstone. That was an election. I know there's all this talk about Russian interference. I'm unmoved. I- I'm unmoved. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, blah, blah, blah. Sounded to me like the people spoke, okay? It wasn't an elect- electoral majority. It was an electoral college majority. Yes, there was a lot of shenanigans and stuff going on, in the, including James Comey, blah, 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 blah. We can't fix all of that. There's always noise. There's always that kind of stuff going on. Touchstone, basic fact. The people spoke. A lot of people don't like what the people were saying. Donald Trump simply is the messenger. Now, I, this is, I'm putting it very starkly. This can be critiqued. I might want to have a more nuanced articulation of this argument going forward. But I'm just basically saying he's the tribune of the people. We don't like it. We don't like the fact that those people won this election. Those people being the ones who stand for this or that or the other, the ones who are titillated by this, that, or the other kind of infusion from Donald J. Trump. He's fit by definition. All this talk about how smart he is, about how decent a person he is and so forth, I, I don't know how anybody really knows. I do know there's an awful lot of wind blowing that's going on out there, but it's irrelevant. He's qualified in virtue of the fact that he articulated very clearly from day one a posture, a view, a, an outlook on a range of issues, and the people endorsed it democratically. Now, now, um, so, so that's, that's my uh, addressing the fitness. Is democracy under threat? Um, did gatekeepers fail? I mean, uh, you know, uh, Trump attacks the press. He says... He does like this, and he says they're fake news. And everybody, or a lot of people, start pulling their hair, talking about the fourth estate is about to be disemboweled. Okay? I don't see that at all. Where is it written that a, that a demagogue, and that's what presidents, I mean, you don't think Obama was selling a, a, a bunch of dreams to people and stuff like that. He wasn't manipulative, that he wasn't... It's, anyway, anyway, I'm, okay, I'll, people will get angry with me. You queer Trump? Obama. Politicians are in the business of, of, of uh, creating images and manipulating people's sentiments and whatever, whatever. So he's fighting back. So let me just finish this. Trump is fighting back. So he fights back because he's got a bad press. So he attempts to discredit the people who are making him look bad. So he's fighting back. Then the, the response is, oh, my God, the sky is falling. Our republic is being disemboweled. We're on our way to Nazism. Well, pardon me if I, for one, am not persuaded by that argument. It sounds like sour grapes. What it sounds like is you've met your match. You used to think you could just tell me what to think, whether it was about the bathrooms or about affirmative action or whether it was about a war somewhere or whether it was about what our social policy be. You used to think you could just lecture to me. It turns out. That voters in Missouri, South Carolina, Wyoming, blah, 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 had a different outlook than the coastal elites. And they won the election. OK, so, no, the sky is not falling. Rather, rather, people who had certain presumptions about their uh, uh, authorization and entitlement to exercise power in this country have found, have learned, have had to learn the hard lesson uh, that they're outnumbered. Uh, or at least they were in 2016 at the ballot box. And in, in, in the effort to discredit what those voters said by attacking Trump is the threat to d- democracy. And it's also f- profoundly contemptuous of the attitudes and values of those people who spoke. Who, you, you think you can sit at the New York Times editorial page and negate by your pen the sentiments of pro-life people, the sentiments of people who don't know about gender in the bathrooms, the sentiments of people who want, who want to put America's interests first. You think it's a refutation of wanting to put America's interests first to lecture from your haughty post, as Charles Blow does in every column that he writes, just to give one example, wagging your fingers in the face of America? You're the most anti-democratic, the most elitist, the most presumptuous and entitled and dangerous people 
I'm seeing. Okay, end of my rant. Thank you. you know, see, I just think that's so misconceived. In a couple, of <laughs> first of all, we have a guy who, who, whose entry into political life was making a series of statements that Speaker Paul Ryan said that is the definition of a racist statement. He's a person who said that who who he who challenged whether President Obama was born in the United States, which is how dare he? How dare he challenge whether the great old Barack Obama was born in the United States? If, if you want to challenge whether Ted Cruz or uh, uh, John McCain, uh, if they were born in Panama or if they might have been born in Canada, were born in the United States, that's just fair political fodder. But how dare you, racist bastard, raise the issue of whether or not Barack Obama was born in the United States? Uh, Barack Obama, by the way, was born in the United States. Okay, I don't have any doubt about that. I read David Garrow's thousand-page biography of the young Obama. I read it. Okay. And the evidence that Obama was born in Honolulu is overwhelming. We even know the address of the apartment that his mother was living in when she delivered that baby. I mean, there's not any doubt about that. I'm not doubting that at all. But the idea that a political clown would attack Barack Obama's birthplace doesn't constitute the worst offense in the world. Okay. So uh, there, um, there's a couple things about that. One is it's not even intended to be believed. It is basically disparaging. It is disparaging him as un-American, and, uh, and uh, in a way that President Trump, in many many ways, violates the norms of live, of a pluralist democracy. And in my eyes, he is. You're right. He was. He he won the election, and and I think there's a number of ways that Democrats should be chastened by that. And we are fighting back. Uh, I think the things that make me encouraged are the ways that Democrats are, are paying more attention to these state and local races and actually mobilizing and learning from the Tea Party rather than having contempt for it in the ways that it's politically effective. And I think that yeah, I am optimistic that we can retake the House in 2018 and, and, and exercise the checks and balances that are not being exercised right now. But it is sobering that – a minority of Republican primary voters who were highly motivated by the America first, by the racism, by the uncivil discourse of President Trump were able to get him nominated. And once he was nominated, that that partisan polarization was strong enough so that a lot of other Republicans who, who agree with me about how unworthy President Trump is personally still voted for him. I think partly, by the way, there was a complacency that he would lose. I think that the biggest single factor that allowed President Trump to win was the assumption he would lose anyway, and that just filtered through so many things. But Can I say one thing about that? Excuse me for interrupting, because I know you – just the, the codicil, okay? Think about the social dynamic around that, the presumption that he would lose. It became impossible for any self-respecting middle-of-the-road or left-of-center commentator – whether they were in the academy or writing in the media or whatever, or in the political operative world, to question the dominant narrative that Hillary Clinton was going to bury this guy, to, 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 to raise the possibility that his message might actually appeal in such a way in Western Pennsylvania and then out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and so forth and so on, that, uh, that, that this might really be a threat. It was a kind of political correctness, even during the campaign. There was only one thing that you could say. You couldn't take him seriously. He had to be an absurd candidate. Well, one of the ironies in the whole thing was, the, the, as Adam Server pointed out, the greatest violation of political correctness during the entire campaign was when Hillary Clinton referred to the deplorables. Now, it is – I think one of the ironies in this is you know, racism is a really powerful political force in American life. It is, and especially with a changing – Demography, whereby not whereby non-Hispanic white Christians are becoming a distinct minority in the country, uh, that has set in motion a very powerful political dynamic uh, that allowed President Trump to profit from it, and uh, and I think neither right nor left quite knows how to talk about the fact that yeah, racism actually is an effective political message, and from the right point of view. Just the fact that a lot of Republican voters are motivated by racist messages is a really offensive thing for people to hear, but nonetheless uh, has a lot of truth to it. And from the left's point of view, the idea – you know what? If racism is powerful in American life, we actually have to have political strategies that are effective given that uh, – you know, you know, 
Black Lives Matter is gonna is going to trigger a racist backlash that actually is going to include a lot of American voters in strategic places, and we have to figure out how to be politically effective. Because the very fact that Black Lives Matter's analysis of America has some validity to it means, boy, Black Lives Matter has to be careful in the way that it practices politics because because you can actually lose elections by triggering people's – white people's uh, white identity politics uh, to the point where you will lose. Now, I think what – but let me get back to one of the points that I really disagree with you about. I mean the fact that President Trump won an election – does not indicate his fitness. And and in the fact that he – a democratic system in order to function requires that everybody obey a certain set of basic norms that are not fully codified, that prevent the system from devolving into a majoritarian uh, – you know, authoritarian system that, that that is no longer democratic. And and systematically, President Trump, you know, violates so many norms that uh, – and I think, by the way, after, in the post-Trump period, one of the biggest challenges we have is to figure out how are we going to codify some of these norms, like the presidential pardon power, the, the president's ability to fire the director of the FBI, uh, what, many things that – you know, almost taking us back to the Nixon era, and we have someone who just has no respect for some of uh, you know. Just say that you. There's no law that says you, a candidate, uh, you know, can't say Mexicans are are rapists, and they're you know, and so on. We the system doesn't function uh, when we have someone who who just has no regard for. for and some I assume are good people. I- <laughs> No, I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm not persuaded. And there was actually a moment in what you were just saying where you kind of elided the distinction between majoritarian and authoritarian. That was a kind of sleight of hand move where uh, the, the, you, I assume these norms. Part of what these norms are is limiting what victorious majorities are willing to do to their defeated. Co, yeah, uh, in this it's, case, victorious. In the interest of maintaining the, you know, some kind of civility within the system yeah. going forward, I assume that's the kind of thing uh, that you're talking about. But, but, um, you know, I mean, let's just take this statement. I mean, let me go go with this head on. Uh, Mexico is not sending us our best. Their best. They're sending murderers and rapists, and some I assume are good people. That may not be an exact quote, but that's pretty close to what the uh, then candidate Donald Trump. In announcing his candidacy, he said way back when. Now, there would be, perhaps appropriately, a taboo on saying things like, you know, our black citizens are good people, but too many of them are criminals in our cities. And that's something that we have to deal with if we want to have civility in our cities. There's a reason why a politician wouldn't talk like that. Okay, Uh, Maybe that's part of the norm that you're talking about, which is this understood but unspoken restraint where we don't make explicit ethnic references even when we you know we don't talk about all of my teachers in graduate school were Jewish I mean all of them Paul Samuelson Robert Solo Peter Diamond Franco Modigliani Peter Timmon Richard Eckhouse uh, Marty Weitzman Stanley Fisher I mean I'm, I'm not even trying I'm not even trying I'm just remembering some of the people who taught me when I was in graduate school 30 40 years ago they were all Jewish uh, if you look at who wins the Nobel Prize in economics, blah, 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 I'll, I'll cut this short. OK, Jewish economics. Nobody talks about that. Jews in economics. Nobody speaks like that. Yeah. Okay? I agree that there should be a restraint of some sort or another on that sort of thing. OK, OK, OK. Breaking the restraint that we have on certain conventions like football players standing reverently when the national anthem is played. OK. Like what Saul Alinsky might have uh, urged some of his organizers for radicals to do uh, when uh, they're trying to get the attention of the people in power. They're trying to change the uh, sort of status quo ante. Uh, Breaking of conventions can also be useful. There can be destructive uh, restraint on the ability to recognize. Okay, so so. There's an immigration debate. So there are questions of the cost and benefits. Okay, so there are legitimate concerns about criminal aliens, legitimate concerns. 
The idea that a person would rule that out of discussion a priori is already a very biased political statement. So, no, somebody but decides, but somebody, just, let me just finish this. They decide to fly in the face of the taboo, mm -hmm. okay, and call a spade a spade. Now, of course, the people who disagree with them are going to label them as a racist. But there is an angle of vision on political process in which that act can be productive and constructive. It breaks down a set of taboos and throws into relief the issues that are at play and forces people to confront and deal with those issues. He had the MS-13 uh, victims uh, at the State of the Union address. OK, you can't. Now, I know that Nancy Pelosi didn't approve of that. Well, let me, I, I'm, I'm quite certain of that. But but, you know, OK, anyway, I've talked long enough. I'm sorry. Let me give you a chance. By the way, the ethnic stereotyping also goes with a lot of straight up lying and uh, and using, you know, there's 11 million undocumented uh, immigrants in the United States who represent the full range of human behavior, virtues and vices. And uh, and it's so, you know, Secretary Sessions was talking about the violence in Chicago and was and was talking about how July 4th weekend we had had a spate of homicides. And he said it's a sanctuary city. And they've got all as if there was some connection between the two. We actually looked at all the homicides that had occurred that weekend, and we had a tragic weekend, and none of them involved anyone. Yeah, that seemed to be connected to sanctuary cities that I could find. Yeah, that was Attorney General Sessions to whom you're referring, not Secretary. Sorry, Attorney General Sessions. I yeah, I, yeah, and it is, uh, you know, there's no question. I, I don't think anyone in America has ever believed that criminal aliens should be in some way uh, given deferential treatment. And in fact, one of the arguments for, uh, you know, the Obama approach to immigration, the Rahm Emanuel approach to immigration is that if you want to focus on the criminal aliens, that the way that you do that is you build a partnership with communities that include families of mixed status. Yeah. And you say, hey, you got to tell us who the M13, yeah. MS-13 people are. And so there's no, there's no empirical validity to the... Uh, to the racist rhetoric, you know, it seems to me that you know, if this were, if we ran back the clock to the first America firsters, I'm sure that they were, uh, you know, if you looked at a newspaper from 1936 in New York City, they would be filled with pictures of you know, lefty Lefkowitz, the gangster who did who who killed somebody, or Louis Lepke, you know, and 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 Lucky Luciano, and so let me be clear about something. I want to be clear about something. I, I'm with you. I'm with you that demagoguery can enter in here and and can disturb. Here's, here's what I want to ask. So there's this general argument out there. You know George Borjas, you know the guy that writes about immigration at Harvard, and uh, he's one of the people I think who would advocate for this um, what they call merit based. Uh, shift to merit, where you examine the individual's qualities and you try to admit the people who have it. Okay, so there's a positive and there's a negative. The positive in that is they got a PhD, the guy's an astrophysicist, you let him in and you give him a visa. The negative part of it is the guy's a drug dealer, the guy's a violent criminal, he's a rapist, you don't let him in with him. Now, in order, to, in order to implement anything like that, you have to be willing to talk about, Not, I agree, you should not use false stereotypes and blanket labels Oh, the Chinese tend to be smart. Let's let them in. Uh, the Nigerians tend to be uh, gangsters. Let's keep them out. You know, you definitely want to do that. But at the individual level, you do want to talk about. And, and I'm, I'm trying to understand whether or not you think that with respect to Mexican immigration, or immigration across the southwestern border of the country, there's any reason to be scrupulous about the what I'm going to call the bottom end of the merit spectrum. Mm -hmm. Not letting in what I'm going to call "quote unquote" bad people is that a, is that something simply not to be worried about uh, in a way that we might be worried about finding the "quote unquote" good people, people who are bringing money, starting businesses, have skills or whatever, and making sure we admit. Them. Well, I, I see what I'm asking. Well, I I do think that uh, I mean Sandy Jenks, by the way, in the New York Review about ten years ago, had a great article about how uh, about how bipartisan immigration reform has lost its political legitimacy because the obvious thing that has to be done is you have to amnesty people who've been here a long time who are effectively Americans who are part of American communities and then you have to do something to enhance border security uh, and say that you know, you know we're actually going to have some kind of enforcement 
mechanism that is publicly legitimate. And many, many voters say, well, we're going to do step one, but an alliance of the corporate community and immigration communities politically will make sure that number two never happens. And therefore, we refuse to do step one. And that that basically uh, defeats the possibility of, of of immigration reform that elites support. I'm sorry, I lost the train of your argument. What are step one and step two? So step one is you have to humanely have some kind of path to citizenship or amnesty okay. for people who've been here a long time. Right. And step two is you have to enforce the, the board. And step two is is things like some sort of sup- in both supply and demand side enforcement because you cannot have you cannot have a class of exploitable workers who are in the shadows that. Uh, you know that that firms, can, you know, when you see these meat plants where almost everyone employed is undocumented, and obviously they're they're being sought out as workers by the uh, by the firm, uh, and and so many voters are cynical that that we w- that we would actually yeah. force our laws against new immigration. I, I do think that there's you know that we need to have a debate about how to balance the economic and social issues with you know uh, with with our borders. The problem is that. That we have to do that in a way that, first of all, is not racist and that uh, that does not make the whiteness of immigrants an explicit policy uh, criterion, which is really. Is it OK if it becomes a correlate but not an explicit? Is it OK if it happens to be the case that we define merit in such a way that disproportionately uh, so-called white, so-called white uh, prospective immigrants are, uh, uh, you know, get chosen at a higher rate. Uh, it just so happens that way chips fall the way they fell because we had a merit-based system. Would that be okay? Uh, does any racial disparity, racial, why are we even applying the category of race to people coming into this country from every corner of the world? They don't know that they're white or they're black until they get here. Well, it's they, a they may not bizarre know. way of thinking. Well, they may not why, know. why is it racist? Well, I, mean, I, really, I really seriously mean this. Well, let me ask you. If well, I had a policy that had the effect of privileging uh, for admission because of the criteria, not because of their race, people who came from Northern Europe, and had the effect of uh, relatively disadvantaging people who came from south of the equator, entering into the United States, whatever the policy was about their education, their skills, their wealth, their business, whatever. Why would I want to call such a policy racist? It seems like a, a... projection of something that's a peculiarly American historical phenomenon onto a global canvas. Well, the problem is that, well, this is where the president performs a useful service because he says, he because he, he speaks the quiet part. And he basically said, you know, Norway is not a skill, as somebody uh, said. <laughs> Whether, whatever people think about their own race, uh, native-born Americans have views about what race people are that influences public policy. And and you know, President Trump was not saying we need more Nigerian doctors and fewer Nigerian Seven Eleven. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, Neymar. Let me. I want to ask you another question. Our time I want to get back to the norms also, and in, in how people should respond to Trump. And we may have some common ground there, I think. But but go ahead. You, uh, you were going to raise something else. Yeah. Um, uh, you just pointed out that white Christian um, Americans are becoming a minority. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are crowing about the, a lot of people are crowing about the browning of America. They're, they're, they're celebrating the idea that America will be a, a majority minority nation. They like the, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, didn't she just, I think I just read this in the newspaper the day or two ago, talking about her granddaughter or something like that, say of this uh, person that they wanted to be the granddaughter wanted to be brown eyed and brown skinned because she wants to look like the future of America. Okay. Is that kind of talk, talk that celebrates the declining prominence of whiteness in America, talk that envisions America as a multi hued country or as a, a country that, like the world itself, like the planet itself, is majority non European racist? Is, is that racism? Well, and if not, why not? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I I think that you know the, the country is becoming. We're having a profound demographic transition in the country, and we're having, and every society I think would struggle with that. Uh, and the idea that 
that that white Christians would become a distinct minority in the country. There are not too many democratic societies that have gone through those transitions, and that is a difficult thing. I think I don't celebrate. I don't think we should celebrate, in particular, any demographic trend. And dem- demography is what it is. I do think what we can celebrate is an idea of Americanness, which is based on your fidelity to a set of ideas in a pluralist democracy that makes it possible that you could have a Browning of America. And, you know, it's funny. I must say my Jewish identity has been so – I've been thinking a lot about it, you know, since Trump has come to the fore Uh, and and sort of the ways that Jews have – you mentioned that, you know, the Jewish history in America is such a – in many ways is one of ascendance. Uh, uh, But it's also one where we are not white Christian obviously and – and, you know, the idea that I'm as American as, as a person who, whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower is a beautiful idea. And, and you know, we've never been fully – we've never fully honored that. I mean the African-Americans who came over on the Mayflower or soon after, uh, you know, were, were never given the opportunity to have that same Americanness uh, – you know, as the as the alien within, and 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 to, okay. Know. Let me add something very quickly on this. So I would have answered my question to you differently. I would have said yes, it is racist, although not as perniciously so as the other. But then I would have gone on to say, the only non-racist posture is a transracial humanistic posture. Well, that's the posture I want to get to. Oh, okay. So then we're on the same page about that. I mean, I I would have said that the antidote to the resentment of a white Christian becoming a minority is not to crow. You know, you had it. You had the upper hand for so long. Now get used to it. But it's rather than to say, who cares who's white, who's black, who's brown and who's yellow, that that needs to also be incorporated into our uh, idea of Americanness, just as we're in some sense trans religious in our civic sensibility. We're all Americans. You're a Jew. I'm a Christian of a certain stripe. Uh, so, too, ought we sh- in the long run be hoping to uh, see ourselves and understand ourselves in racial terms. And in that respect, people, progressive people, are pushing in exactly the wrong direction, in my opinion. Well, I don't think in our in our daily lives and politics, I really don't think that we are. I mean, I mean, if you look at the way that I mean, there's people you can certainly find a statement where people are crowing. Uh, but, you know, you, you go through all the statements of Barack Obama as a politician. You know, he's certainly not crowing about that. And he's saying, he's saying I exemplify the, the, the opportunity of America. No, in nowhere but America is my story possible. Now, is that – obviously that's a political – you know, he, he, he employs the devices of political rhetoric. But let me just ask you very quickly, very quickly. Okay. So, so during the campaign, he emphasized that. He says, I'm black, black and white. It's in my very DNA. DNA. He's black and he's white. Yeah. He's black. His white mother, his white grandmother. Okay. Yeah. That's during the campaign. But he doesn't govern as, he's, as if he's black and white. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I mean it as an observation. He becomes the first black president. And that seems to drown out the I'm black and I'm white. I, he was, or maybe he's not given the opportunity to do it. Maybe that's the answer. But anyway. I think he was, he was so – he was so defined. I think your statement when – I, when I try to go through the practical policies that, that, that Barack Obama espoused and the way that he carried himself, uh, he, was, he was a successful liberal democratic president who pushed for – Health health policies that gave health insurance to people in rural Kentucky who all voted against him. Uh, he is the the idea that he somehow uh, retaliated against the white majority for the grievances of African Americans, or that he somehow disrespected uh, the. Pay- no, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, I mean, what I mean is vis a vis the civil disturbances that uh, arose, for example, after. Uh, Ferguson, Missouri, and whatnot, after uh, Trayvon Martin and whatnot. Uh, he became a black president in a way with his black attorney general and uh, whatnot, uh, attorneys general, that uh, he might have uh, hewed more to a kind of uh, transracial, uh, whatever. It's easy for me to say this. I remember some of the speeches that he gave, and they were magnificent speeches at the memorial for those police officers who were slain in Dallas, at the 
sight of the terrible slaughter of those people in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and others that if I thought about it, I could uh, come up with. I mean, where he was masterful, I thought, at navigating, I mean, a way that the current president makes you long for somebody who had that, had that particular gift that, of public leadership. But I thought if my son were, uh, if Trayvon, my, if I had a son, he looked like Trayvon was a, was a mistake. I thought it was a bad mistake. I thought I happen to know a little something about White House conference meetings with law enforcement and Black Lives Matter activists dealing with violence, because I know somebody who I don't want to name was in the room. But, um, you know, I, I think the, uh, the activist and the Al Sharpton, Al Sharpton, you know, et cetera. I don't think a guy who's black and who's white and who's trying to lead the country down the middle on racial issues brings Al Sharpton into his let White me, House. Let me just say, I, I must say, there's a, there's a, when I listen to conservative critique of President Obama, there's a sort of now look what you made me do aspect to the way that they talk about it. I mean, you know, we just elected a racist demagogue president of the United States who in every way is the photographic negative of every virtue that Barack Obama had. You know, if Donald Trump were an African-American guy in the south side of Chicago, first of all, he would have gotten himself shot because he, because he can't avoid getting into a fight with everybody. And secondly, he would have been laughed off the stage of American politics long ago. You know, in order to be a black, you know, as, as Ta-Nehisi Coates says, in order to be president, to be the first black president, you have to be Barack Obama. If you're white, you can be Donald Trump. I mean, here, you, you know, you have this clown who is, uh, so so to yeah. me, that's just, I, I just, but, but, but let me shift. I'm not, buying, I'm not buying that. Well, let's shift over to the norm question, and okay. which is a sort of yeah. interesting game theoretic question. So I look at the history of the Republican Party over the past 10 years, and I see... You know, Donald Trump's not the only one who was a norm breaker. You know, there's no rule that says that every Supreme Court just you know, every Supreme Court nominee deserves a hearing, but yeah. Merrick Garland was the first who didn't get one. Yeah. And there's the debt ceiling, and there's McConnell's reaction when the FBI and the intelligence community came to him in the in 2016 and said, you know, we got this Russian stuff going on. We need to have a bipartisan. Response and McConnell basically said to the president, "If you go public with this Russia thing, uh, I'm going to basically say you're doing a partisan." Uh, this is news to me. I'm uh, I'm sorry to be uninformed. This is the FBI going to Obama and McConnell separately, I assume, but trying to get something out about Donald Trump's campaign and connections to Russia. It was it was there was a meeting in the fall of. There was a meeting in the summer slash fall of 2016 where intelligence community and law enforcement people and Obama administration people went to Capitol Hill. And that basically the idea was there should be a joint statement issued to Russia that says do not meddle in our election. Oh, not about Trump. This is about Russia. But it also include there was an element and they were they were they were they were interceding on the side of Trump. And what McConnell said was, if you do this, I will basically say that that this is a partisan... Okay, so how do we know this? And forgive my ignorance. How do we know this? I mean, this would be a whole other... And I would not be the best person to do the whole Russia, you know... Uh, okay, but this has come out in the course of the investigation. This has been out for... This is this is this was known... Uh, this has been known... Uh, deep secret, what I'm telling you. Is that, you know, the intelligence community quickly determined that Russia was interceding on the side of Trump, and they and they and there was an effort to make a bipartisan... Uh, thing and, and McConnell. I didn't know about the effort. Mm-hmm. And, and there's many other things I could give. And so, uh, and so, and then, and then there's the election of Trump. And so there's a question: How should Democrats respond in a way that is a strategically effective, and b reestablishes rather than further undermines some of the norms that we believe Republicans have violated? So, for example, I am uncomfortable when people personally insult Trump. You know, I. Tammy Duckworth, my senator, who I who left a couple of legs in Iraq, so I can understand why she's why she has a particular view. But she referred to him as cadet bone spurs, uh, you know, in, in in public utterance. I don't like that. I sort of think he's the president. We should speak to him. We should speak about him with decorum. Um, but I also don't think we should be patsies. And there's a need for a kind of tit for tat response to some of these things and just say, you know, we really do believe this guy is not normal and we're not going to treat him the way we treated other political figures. 
and I go back and forth about where I want to draw that line about. Like, I, I don't want to boo at the State of the Union, but I kind of want to sit there with cold civility, not clapping either. Uh, and, I, and I find myself spending a lot of time thinking about how to – what the right stance is that respects the institutions while expressing uh, not only – not only our disdain for the president as a person, but also the need to say to Republicans, you know, you have not behaved in a way that we think respects these norms. So what's your, I t- yeah, I'm taking it that you were, that you're really. I'm shaking my head because I mean, you want, you want unilateral disarmament and you want them to, to commit suicide. I mean, holding Mitch McConnell and uh, uh, Paul Ryan responsible for not quote, reigning in Trump, close quote, uh, ask that they adopt the uh, sensibility of David Brooks. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I mean, not to disparage David, but I just mean to say a Republican who can write the kind of columns that David Brooks writes in the New York Times and can kind of, you know, maintain his, uh, you know, uh, New York uh, Upper West Side legitimacy or whatever. No, no, no. And, 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 and the, base, the base that elected Trump doesn't look anything like this. These guys are worried about getting primary. They're worried about, uh, you know, managing uh, the scarce and uh, a fleeting resource that they have, which is majorities of these legislators and getting some stuff through. And they have a person in their own party who uh, did it. And because you and many other people, but unfortunately not a, a sufficient number to prevent Trump from having been elected, uh, find, find that to be an abhorrent outcome uh, means that they're supposed to not exploit the opportunity that they have, just like uh, uh uh, this Merrick Garland, uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch thing. I agree with you that the norm got trashed. You're telling me that Harry Reid didn't trash norms? Uh, somehow I remember that being able to get a piece of legislation through with 50 votes, whether it was uh, or confirming judges, or whatever, was something that the Democrat. Everybody is. It's a power game. How many how many divisions has the Pope? Who said that? Did Stalin say that? I mean. You can you can wag your finger all you want. It's a power game. These guys are not going to see power gratis because because somebody is going to, some moralizer is going to conclude that uh, you know they didn't quote behave responsibly. I, I, I don't understand that argument. There's a couple of things there. One is I think this what you just said indicates to me why I am much less confident in American institutions than I used to be. The checks and balances system is much more dependent on partisanship than we had previously really thought through. And the fact is they are protecting the president and a lot of you know, big and little things like his tax returns. Obviously, the Democrats win the House. The House peanut committee is going to subpoena you know, uh, Trump's taxes and we'll find – you know, but you know, the, 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 that the incentives <laughs> to provide partisan cover for fairly obvious misconduct like the Trump Hotel uh, – you know that those incentives are really strong when you have a party base that backs the president, and that we can't count on uh, we can't count on checks and balances to operate when there's unified government. That's actually, uh, you know, uh, that's a pretty cons- that's a big institutional challenge. Uh, I'm not saying I have a great answer to it, uh, you know, because there's a number of ways, like this Nunes memo thing, where you know Nunes was on the Trump transition team. He put together a misleading memo, which is obviously intended, you know, to, you know, to be played on Fox TV, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's there is. So you think there's nothing and I'm not endorsing the Nunes memo thing. I don't want to get into the mem- memo gate. Yeah. Uh, but but I just want to ask you, do you think there's nothing? I mean, because Lindsey Graham and uh, who's the other who have called for a criminal investigation of the conduct of the FBI and the Justice Department and handling that stuff? There's, there's nothing to a concern about uh, how a FISA warrant was gathered, about what the relationship between a campaign, Hillary Clinton's campaign, uh, and uh, people who were in the federal bureaucracy, like those people at the top of the FBI, uh, might have been. That there's nothing. There's no there there. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. But the same people who are who wanted this criminal investigation also by the reauthorized all the FISA stuff. I mean, there's a. The, the level of bad faith in all this argument is, especially from the same people who are investigating Benghazi, you know, of course, out the wazoo is, is total. Um, I, I don't think that – I don't think there's much of a there there actually with the FISA thing. And in fact, you know, the FBI had told the judges that there was a political source, uh, you know, for the document. It's just a, – it's a dishonest memo. But the basic point is the purpose of that memo is is – 
to provide partisan cover and it's being written by the chairman of the committee who's nominally supposed to be investigating the president but who in fact has been going – who has a whole relationship with the White House – that he had been recused from the investigation for some period of you know that that there's just no credibility that this is actually being in you know that 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 that, that Chairman Nunes and his fellow guys are 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 trying to investigate uh, a you know incredibly serious charge that a you know President Trump enthusiastically embraced the help of a foreign country to help himself. <laughs> I mean, it's just you you don't know that. You don't, how do you know that you just made a, a declaration which, I, t- to my knowledge, hasn't been demonstrated? President Trump enthusiastically embraced the assistance of a foreign country in the conduct of his electoral aspirations in 2016. How do you know that? Oh, I, I think that there's a lot. I mean, this would be a whole separate. Isn't that the thing that uh, uh, Mueller's, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, Mueller's investigation either should or should not conclude? They should either issue a definitive report stating exactly what you stated and you know, conveying it to the House of Representatives for the uh, House Judiciary Committee for consideration of articles of impeachment because, in effect, the man sitting in the White House is a traitor. Okay? Either he's going to conclude that or he should conclude that there is an insufficient evidence to draw such a conclusion. But how can you sit there and say this no, as if you knew it was a fact? There's, a, there's, there's so many to – me, to me, there's so many things that are – the criminal as- aspect is a whole other question, but there's so many ways that President Trump just openly, you know, he, there were all those things where he said to Russia, do you have the missing emails? Uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s conversations were, were he at this meeting in Trump Tower where, uh, where he went with the hope that there was dirt on Hillary Clinton. You know, there's just, there's just a million things like that. There's, but I just, <laughs> let, me just, let me finish, though. And you know what? You sound like somebody sitting around in 1950 talking about communists. You, you, you really, you really, really do. There's so much evidence. Look who he went to school with. Look what he had to say during that speech about the New Deal. In, in 1946, he made how many trips to Russia did he make in 1938 while the famine was killing off the kulaks in the millions? That's what this sounds like to, to me. You, to me, there's uh, many of the president's defenders sound like the defenders of Alger Hiss. You know, that just <laughs> – and the guy's obviously dirty. Well, let's leave aside the Russia thing though for a moment. The Trump Hotel is obviously – uh, and the Trump family's commercial and public policy. In yeah, I, I agree with that. It's quite unseemly. It's quite unseemly. We don't seem to know how to do that. And I agree with you. It's because the Republican Congress won't insist on it. I, I agree with that 100%. But let me, but let's get there to should me. be way arm's length. This question should not even be coming up. There should not be official meetings at the Doral Golf Resort of foreign delegations coming, spending many, many hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars over a weekend. I agree with that 100 percent. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just it's just obvious out there in plain sight. And and the question is, how are our institutions going to deal with that? And and so far, the answer is, if you are the same party as the president and he is shameless about it, that that he can get away with a lot more than we might have expected uh, because so much of the regulation of the president was was based on either informal norms or a belief that Congress would stop certain things that they just won't stop. And I do think, by the way, so a couple of things I, about about this because we should wrap up. It's getting to be yeah, it's been an hour. The um, one is, I think that the resistance to Trump has there's a lot of good from it. That first of all, Democrats realize the way we're going to hold President Trump accountable is not by yelling about him, but by actually mobilizing and winning elections. And, Below the level of the president, which President Obama's greatest failure was not in his own personal comportment and leadership, but in his failure to go beyond himself to all these governorships, Senate, House seats. Uh, you know, some of it has to do with with all the you know. There's a, Democrats are at some structural disadvantages due to gerrymandering and the structure of the Senate, all that other stuff. But also, we we have to be attentive. One of the great things right now is I don't care who the next Democratic presidential nominee is. I think we should we should be so focused on other things and not worry about that. And people are, and I think that's very positive. And I think that President Trump is forcing us – and ironically, the reaction to him has ratified public consensus on a bunch of values that he doesn't share, that he's forced us to articulate and defend. One, of course, being universal coverage. He's ratified the consensus behind ACA with the repeal effort. I think that 
that that the overt racism and corruption of the Trump administration is going to force a reckoning. You know, one of the things about Trump's coalition is it's a very old, it's a it's demographically a very old one. And I think a lot of younger people, people who might be politically conservative or economically conservative are saying, that's not a product I want to buy. You know, I, I that there's, that's just the, the dishonorable aspect of President Trump is something that people are going to reckon with. You know, look at William Crystal, people like that, who are certainly not liberals, who are saying, you know what, we, we are, there's a patriotic obligation to, to, to have a reckoning with this and a reckoning with a country that could elect President Trump. How do we have to do things differently? And I think that's very positive. Uh, and I, I think that uh, I think there's so many possible ways this can go. President Trump could be reelected. I think that's possible. I think he could not be president three years from you know two years from now. That's possible. There's just a really wide open possibility. And you know you opened by saying that it's kind of a privilege to live when history is being made. And I I believe that too. That it is. It's not fun uh, by any means. And there are people who are being hurt. The DACA kids being the most obvious example. People being hurt, it's not a good thing, but it is a privilege to see, to have a chance to revisit the basic norms of our society and our political institutions and to say, okay, they're now being tested. How do we make them actually work better? And if we use this moment well, uh, we may come out of it uh, not unscathed, but a stronger country for that. And I think that's something that I, I I hope that that's five years from now, that that's what you and I are observing as we look back on the unfortunate experience of the Trump presidency. Well, Trump Trump may still be president five years from now, as you've acknowledged, but in any case, I'm letting you have the last word, Harold. Uh, There's no need for rebuttal. That was eloquent. And I certainly do hope we're able to sit five years from now and have another conversation of this sort. Thanks for coming on the Glenn Show, Harold, and putting up with my uh, <laughs> contrarian disposition. It was not unexpected. <laughs> uh, and welcome.